Let me explain what protandum is and what it does. Protandum is a NERF2 activator, and I realize that doesn't say anything to you guys if you're not a biochemist or a, have a PhD in some biomedical science. But I'm going to tell you very briefly what a NERF2 activator is and what it does. It can be viewed as a biochemical wake-up call. It, literally, these substances are messengers. And the way protandum acts, and many of you have seen this before, but this is the, the single summary slide of what protandum does when it approaches a human cell. And so in the upper right there, you see something labeled protandum. You've just taken a protandum. It's found its way into your bloodstream. It's reaching every cell in your body. And when protandum approaches any human cell, there are receptors on the surface of that cell. It's the analogy I use. It's like protandum steps on your front porch, and it rings your doorbell. What happens inside that cell is there's a change occurring, just like when your chime goes off or your doorbell rings. Pushing the button outside has caused a change inside. In this case, an enzyme has been activated. An enzyme is a machine that does something chemically within the cell. In this case, it's a kinase. You don't have to remember that. And here it's signified by being activated. It turned yellow, but now it's turned on by protandum. What does it do? Well, the important uh, player here is that little red circle labeled NERF2. That's the, the biochemical messenger that needs to send information to the DNA in the nucleus of every cell in your body. And it's being held outside. The messenger is stuck to a blue protein there called KEEP1. And that complex is modified by this kinase. And what you can see is a little yellow group was added to NERF2. It's been chemically modified. So that activated enzyme caused by protandum ringing the doorbell, if you will, has modified NERF2, changed its structural shape. It looks different to the blue protein that's holding it. And as a result, the blue protein lets go of the, pro of the NERF2. The blue protein, by the way, is stuck to the skeleton of the cell, so it's outside the nucleus. And that's where it's been holding NERF2. Now that NERF2 has been modified, it's released by the blue protein, and it's free to diffuse into the nucleus of every cell where the DNA resides. The DNA is the master blueprint for that cell, contains the plans for producing everything that cell needs to make. When protandum goes in there, Sorry, when NERF2 goes in there, it now has access to 25,000 genes that are in the nucleus of every cell in your body. And about four or 500 of those genes have receptors where that NERF2 can bind and act. You can think of it as a key and a lock, or you can think of it as a, an electrical switch that gets flipped. The NERF2 finds the 500 genes that it can modify, it binds to them, it turns on that gene, and the end result is all 500 of those genes upregulate the thing that they encode, the blueprint for, for which they are for some product that the cell makes. So in this case, protective enzymes are produced in response to protandum. That's how it works in a nutshell. The actual biochemistry is a little more complicated, but not much. That's really, that's, and seriously, that's very close to the way I would explain this to my peers. That's what protandum does. It activates NERF2. The cell makes more of its protective survival-related enzymes. So here I'm using a slightly different twist on the theme, stay tuned with protandum. If you look up tune in a dictionary, which I did here, Merriam-Webster online, you type in tune and you find that uh, there are several definitions. It's to adjust musical pitch. Uh, everyone's familiar with that. You can tune an instrument. You can tune a piano. It brings it into harmony. It's a way of adjusting something for precise functioning. So you can take your car into a mechanic and you can tune up the engine. 
It's to make more precise, more intense, or effective. And here at definition one, the example given there is tuned her guitar. Okay, so you can tune something to the right frequency, the right pitch. And if you look this definition up a few years from now, I'm hoping at the bottom there may be an addition. As, for example, grandma tuned her genome <laughs> with percandum. <clears throat> All right, well, how, how is that going to work? Let me, let me expand a little bit. A, a piano keyboard has 88 notes on it, and each note, you probably don't think about this even if you play a piano, but each note has an assigned frequency. You hit that note, you hear a tone that is a very precise frequency. Those are the actual frequencies for all 88 of those. They are defined, and if that key is not on that particular frequency, we would say that piano is out of tune, right? So let's suppose that in 1947, Grandma bought a brand new piano, and this is one chord from that keyboard, from the chord below middle C, so it's from low C to mid C, 13 notes. Each of them has a defined frequency, and when, when that piano was delivered to Grandma, every one of those 13 keys was right on or very close to the defined frequency for each of those notes. And as happens with pianos, let's assume that for whatever reasons, Grandma's piano spent 50 years in the attic. And maybe the grandchildren discover it, bring it down, dust it off, and check it out. Well, after 50 years in the attic, things had changed. And if you hit those 13 keys now, you'll find that they're not on the precise frequency. The piano is out of tune and needs to be brought back into tune. It needs to be tuned up by a guy who knows what he's doing. He will bring tuning forks. He will listen very carefully, adjust each of those keys until it's back where it should be. And the same thing happened to Grandma, by the way, in those 50 years. <laughs> if, if you look at her genome, and instead of 88 keys, we're looking at uh, 25,000 keys in the genome, where each key is one gene. And to be properly function, functioning, if we looked at Grandma's genome when she was 20 years old, no oxidative stress to speak of, those genes would have been in tune. These are the 400 genes, and this is real data from my laboratory, from human cells, 400 genes that respond most to protandum being added to the culture medium. And the height of, there are 400 little bars here, and you can't see them individually, but the height of each one tells you how frequently that gene is being expressed, how often that blueprint is being called out of the nucleus of that cell and functionally translated into the product uh, for which that blueprint uh, encodes. This is the way those 400 genes are expressed when uh, oxidative stress is low. So we could call this a properly tuned genome. Because you can't see the individual genes when they're that many, I've taken a little area in the center part of this randomly in that red box, which is about 63 genes. And we're going to look at that a little more closely. They're now spread out. You can see them individually. The name of each gene is on the bottom of the axis, and they don't mean much to you, and some of them don't mean much to me. Some of them... <laughs> Some of them, in fact, are of unknown function. We know the gene is there. We know its sequence. We don't fully understand what that gene does. But in other cases, we know exactly what it does, what disease it may be involved in. So this is, six, I think, 63 genes chosen uh, just to be in the middle of that range. And this is how they're expressed when oxidative stress is low, uh, specifically when protandum is in the medium. If we grow, and this is in a human cell line. If we grow these same cells without protandum under conditions that have oxidative stress, what do you think it looks like? It looks like that, okay? 
So that's equivalent to grandma's piano after 50 years in the attic. And the difference between that and this is pro tandem. All right. It's a dramatic <laughs> illustration. <laughs> And let, let me point out to you, too, how, how dramatically things have changed. Protanum was developed primarily to affect three gene products, superoxide dismutase, or SOD, catalase, and glutathione peroxidase. And the literature, as of five years ago, led us to believe that this could happen, this would happen with protanum. And indeed, it did affect those three genes. What we've learned in the last five years is that it affects not only those 63 genes, but these 400 genes, all right? So three of those are SOD, catalase, and glutathione, have, or glutathione peroxidase. Have we realized that protandum does a lot more than that? You bet. We went from three genes to four or 500 genes that we're now talking about. Each of, each of those genes has its own story, and I, I your eyes would quickly glaze over if I went through the first 200 of those. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is give you an example on each end of the spectrum in the few minutes remaining. One of the genes that caught my eye when I looked at this entire 400 genes was at one end of the spectrum. That is, of all the genes that are downregulated, which one is downregulated the most? And this gene called fatty acid binding protein 4, meant nothing to me at the time, was strongly downregulated by protandum. And I'll show you the data in a, in a moment. And so what do I do when I see something like that? Well, I go to pubmed.gov that I showed you earlier. I type in fatty acid binding protein 4, or FABP4, the name of that gene. And my question is, what is this involved in? Is it good to be high? Is it good to be low? What do we know collectively about fatty acid binding protein 4? And this paper appeared um, just in the last month. And it says that this one and a related gene, fatty acid binding protein 5, another gene, are related to the metabolic syndrome. All right, That's epidemic in this country. That's when people get older, they get obese, it involves inflammation, it involves atherosclerosis, it involves type 2 diabetes, it involves calcification of arteries. A lot of nasty things are related to these two gene products. The conclusions from this paper, I just kind of summarized, FABP4 and to a lesser extent, FABP5 contribute to insulin resistance, which is part of type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, cardiovascular disease. Reduction of FABP4 provides a striking resistance to the development of insulin resistance and multiple features of the metabolic syndrome. All right, that's powerful. In this paper, they could lower FABP4 by genetic manipulations, things that we can't do to ourselves, but we can do to animals in a lab, provided resistance uh, to metabolic syndrome. And uh, at the bottom there, FABP4 is associated with metabolic syndrome, inflammation, coronary calcification in humans. What does protandum do to it? On the left, you see the effect of protandum on human cells in culture the left bar is the control without protandum. At two concentrations of protandum increasing, you see an 85% reduction of this FABP4 gene product. The related one, FABP5, showed a 66% reduction in response to protandum. All right, the higher this gene is, the more likely you are to get metabolic syndrome, uh, calcified arteries, and the related bad things that happen. At the other end of the spectrum, another gene, and again, when I saw this one, this is one of the most potently upregulated genes by protandum. Uh, the gene is named AKR1B10. That didn't mean anything to me, even though I'm a biochemist. 
It's a human aldohedra reductase. But I, I put it in PubMed to see what, what is this gene doing. Protandum strongly cranks it up. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? These two papers were published within the last year. Again, rapidly moving scenario. And look at this title. This gene, uh, AKR1B10, promotes cell survival. Sounds good. By regulating lipid synthesis and eliminating carbonyls. Well, you may not know what carbonyls are, but carbonyls are related to T-bars, which you have heard before, lipid peroxidation products. The conclusions of these two papers is that this uh, uh, gene responds to free radical damage which results in formation of toxic lipid peroxidation products. So that broadly is T-bars. More specifically, it's talking about one of those products, 4-hydroxynonanol, 4-HNE, which may ultimately lead to cell death. These aldehydes damage the DNA. They can cause mutations. And this gene efficiently, the gene product, efficiently catalyzes the reduction of 4-HNE protecting cells from toxic effects. What does protandum do to this gene? The one on the left is the control. And here you see two concentrations, a very low and a higher concentration of protandum, a 3,200%, 32-fold increase in the production of, the, of this gene product. And this is a good one. The more of this you have, the more protected you are. Right? And each of those 400 genes can be analyzed in this way. And I have to tell you, I haven't made my way through all 400 of them, but I spend hours and hours ferreting out what those genes are, what they do. And the overall predominant theme is exactly what you've seen here. The genes that help our cells survive are upregulated. The genes that are doing the damage um, causing the problems are, uh, are being decreased. Um, so I think that's pretty much the end of what I have to say. I want to tell you <laughs> a lot of these guys have contributed to what I've told you today. 